Good afternoon and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I'm your host, Melinda Moulton. And today my guest is Doug Bergstein. How are you, Doug? I am great. Thanks, Melinda, for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This is going to be fun. Um, so in my, in my research of you, Doug, I have found out that you are a fifth and sixth a uh, grade teacher at the Faiston Elementary School. I am. Are the treasurer of the Mad River Valley Recreation District. Mm -hmm. You're a Vermont senior baseball player. <laughs> yeah. An MC for the Warren Fourth of July Parade and a go-to guy for the Valley Players in Waitsfield. Mm -hmm. You are also a director and an actor. So yes. is there anything that I'm missing? I mean, you are like the man... You're a Renaissance <laughs> man. You do so much. Is there anything? Is there anything that I might be missing from this list? Uh, well, um, I, I I I have time, and I'm not very good with being idle. So uh, I help out where I can. I mean, there are a lot of people in the Mad River Valley that do a lot of great volunteer work, and I am uh, I'm always willing to lend a hand. Well, you do, and you're, and thank you for that. I mean, the valley is such a great place, and it's because of people like you. Yeah. Um, but yes. I was exhausted after reading of all the things that you did. I was like, I think I have to go take a nap. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to talk to you for a long time. I've heard your name and known about you for many, many years. But let's start at the beginning for my viewers. Tell us a little bit about Doug Bergstein, where you grew up, a little bit about your family. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. My uh, well, I was actually born in the Boston area and my parents moved. Uh, they wanted to be close to big cities, but not too close. So um, they chose Vermont as a, a spot that's close to Montreal, close to Boston, which is where my mom's parents were, and close to New York City, where my dad's parents were. So I grew up I grew up in Vermont, but I'm not a Vermonter. As you know, that's a multi-generational thing. Um, and uh, I went to I went to school, uh, college at UNH and UVM and San Diego State. I like to call my time at San Diego State my uh, semester abroad because it's really a different country there. <laughs> um, and I ended up settling in Vermont because um, I found a job at Faiston and I started there in 1992 and I have been there ever since, Faiston Elementary that, School. What was that job? Is that your teaching job at Faiston? Yeah, yeah. I, I I got the job as a fifth and sixth grade teacher in 1992, and uh, I never left. Wow. That yeah. sounds and So, And over the years, I have just gotten more and more involved with different things. You know, you meet a lot of people, and uh, interests change, and so you just kind of uh, explore. Well, tell us a little bit about what drew you to teaching. Who was your who was your greatest inspiration in your life, and what yeah, taught, it's what drew you to teaching? <laughs> there are a lot of teachers in my family. Um, on my mom's side, my grand her mother was a Latin teacher in high school, and uh, she was. <laughs> <laughs> she uh, referred to herself as a little old lady in white tennis shoes, and uh, she was a character. Um, and her daughter, my aunt, taught um, uh, mathematics in college. And uh, my dad worked in schools. Uh, he was an artist in residence. And um, I actually started because I, I have a degree in business and I was not a person who was really driven by money, and that's not necessarily a great quality uh, if you're going to go into business. <laughs> um, and then I would just kind of, I did some traveling, and um, a friend who I had met on my travels had asked me to come into his school and do some, uh, just talk about my travels around Europe. And I did that. And then he said, hey, while you're here, why don't you stay and uh, ref the soccer game after school? So I did that. And then he said, hey, I need a sub for Friday. You want to do that? And I was like, OK. And uh, I ended up substitute teaching for a while um, in all the, in high school, all the way down to kindergarten. And what I, I think it, that was a great experience because what it did is allow me to figure out, you know, which kids I connected with most. And it was the middle school, but I wasn't necessarily interested in being in a middle school. I wanted to teach older kids in an elementary school setting and I got it. And I've been there, you know, for 33 years. 
Now that's because um, Baston has a fifth and sixth grade. That's right. All the Valley schools, um, Warren, Faston, Waitsfield, Moortown, they are all pre-K through sixth. And then those kids go to Harwood after that. Or Cross the Brook. They could go to Cross the Brook. Interesting. But you and you teach all subjects. I do. Uh, I mean, over the years, it's been it, it's changed uh, depending on um, what I'm teaching. Like last year, I taught a fourth and fifth grade. This year, I'm teaching a straight sixth. But by and large, I've been teaching a fifth and sixth grade with uh, um, another a teaching partner who also has a fifth and sixth grade. And so I've taught sometimes I just I focus on the math and the science. And then the other teacher teaches the social studies and the literacy. Um, so it's really all over the place, but I, I call myself a general general ed kind of kind of guy. What's your favorite subject to teach? I'm a math guy. Um, I am. Uh, I mean, I like I love teaching social studies because I think it just, you know, you <clears throat> it gives you an open openness into the world. Um, uh, I, I have really begun to love history as I've gotten older, <laughs> which I think is a fairly typical thing. Um, but, uh, I've always had a math mind and, um, I like teaching math because, um, there are some kids who may not be very good with algorithms, which is, you know, the formulas that you and I used, uh, to solve problems, but, um, some kids can be really creative in their problem solving and how they think about it. And I just love the times in class where I'm like, man, I did not see it that way, but you are right on. I love wow. that. So, so why are we teaching civics? I, I had, I don't know if you had civics in school, but I did. Uh, I, well, yes, in high school, I had a civics class. Right. Um, I, I would say that um, civics, well, <clears throat> we have a program that's called, um, uh, oh, geez, I just, uh, I just had a, a blank, a uh, senior moment do I like to call it, say that, uh, responsive okay. classroom. We use responsive classroom, responsive class. which is really, it, it, that I would consider that to be a civics class. It's about uh, interacting with other people, um, learning how to be part of a group, um, learning how to greet one another. The day starts with a morning meeting, and um, you know we touch base with one another. We share things about each other, uh, about ourselves with each other. Um, but civics, are you thinking about like politics? Or well, no. Or we when I was, in, I learned about you know the. The three branches of government, and we learned yeah, sure. how, how our federal government worked and how our state government worked, and it was called. It was a full year of civics. I think I had it in seventh grade. Yeah. Um, well, I know that at Harwood. I mean, I'm. I, I don't know if they have a specific course like that at the middle school at, at Harwood, but I know they have something called three democracies. Oh, good. Which, okay. which is, um, you know, absolutely a civics class. You know, fits in that category. So you're not you're not seeing you're not seeing any book banning. I'm sure no. in on school. Or maybe no. far, but talk to me a little bit about today's educational system, focusing on our country's efforts, some of our country's efforts to ban books and outlaws and outlaw science as true fact. How do you how do you feel Vermont rates? Um, uh, well, I would say Vermont rates very high in that. Um, you know, I I don't know if any. Uh, schools in Vermont that are talking about banning books or talking about, uh, you know, not teaching evolution. Um, you know, my, under my, for my reading, it's, that's pretty much in the South. And it, I think it's pretty sad. And out West too. I'm South West. I was, I was just down at the, uh, the, uh, the planet of words in Washington. I don't know if you've been to that museum. I have not. But they have a whole huge, gymnasium with you know beautiful hardwood and stuff but it's has all the banned books uh, that have been banned in the country but anyway that's neither here nor there we live in a bubble in vermont uh, and, yes we do and we are pretty free to teach reality facts science and truth and that's a good thing now i'm going to ask you your opinion about governor scott's appointment for secretary of education zoe saunders mm -hmm. uh, as we know and my viewers might not know is a former charter school executive from florida Mm -hmm. And she was rejected by the Vermont Senate, but Governor Scott may reappoint her in a permanent capacity. How are you feeling about that? Well, there is, I think there is a big difference between running a charter school and running a public school. Um, you know, a charter school, you can pretty much do what you want. And a public school is working within a, a larger system. You know, I don't know her personally. I don't, I don't know a lot about her, um, 
her background and you know maybe there there are sometimes people who don't know anything about that specific uh system but they have great skills and organization and maybe that's her i don't know yeah uh, but I, I, I'm willing to say that there's a, a, a significant difference between running a charter school and running a public school. You know, public schools are for everyone. And that's hard. I also think you need to know about Vermont and bring uh, sure. it to Florida. Sure. It's just like, come on, you know. Right. It's a it's on, a governor. Yeah. You can, I mean, you know, you asked about the book banning. And, you know, if you come from a place where banning books is the norm and you come to a place where that's unheard of. Uh, Hello. That's a pretty big difference. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not going to work. So, um, let's talk. I, I know the teachers union, the you know the Vermont NEA is against it. Okay. Well, good. Um. Okay. I'm going to move now because we only have half an hour, and I could talk to you for all day. <laughs> let's, let's let's talk about the Mad River Recreation District. Sure. Um. Uh. Talk about that group. Now, there's been a lot going on over the past few years. Um, to take what I consider one of Vermont's top recreational spots to an even higher le level. What are you all working on now and share some of your accomplishments? Well, um, a couple of years ago, we hired uh, an executive director, Laura Arneson. And what that has allowed us to do is really connect with the various uh, volunteer organizations uh within within the mad river valley the mad river planning um the um mad river riders um the uh the friends of the mad river uh you know just so many different organizations and she's been able to reach out and um and and really spearhead some things like we um received the largest uh vorec um vermont vermont outdoor recreation uh, and we got a big grant from Vermont, uh, from the state of Vermont, you know, more than a half a million, almost half a million dollars. And, and she's been instrumental in, um, orchestrating the spending of that. I mean, there was a, it was a huge process to get that money. Um, and so with that, we're able to build some trails, get some bridges built, um, and really try to coordinate things within the Valley. So that was that's one thing that's really recent. A couple of years ago, our chair Rebecca Baruzzi um, was really instrumental in us acquiring some land, which our organization, which was formed in 1993, has really over those over 25 years has been um, a grant giving. We get money from the three towns of Faston, Warren, and Waitsfield, and we give grants to various organizations who are focused on recreation. You know, a lot of kids organizations, Mad River Little League, Mad River Soccer, Mad River Cross, you know, all those youth organizations and some adult organizations, the riders, it, they make trails for everyone. Um, this snow, the, the chapter of the um, snowmobile organization that runs through the Mad River Valley. Um, we, we have a quite a, the pickleball gets money from us. So we had, our, we had mostly been functioning as uh, getting the money from the towns and distributing it to these different organizations. Um, mostly that, well, the, it was or, the, the um, Mad River Recreation was organized because the towns were a little bit tired of these individual groups coming to the different select board meetings and asking for money. And they were like, let's put this all in one place. I mean, the Mad River Valley, it, yes, it's different towns, but um but it's really one community, right. you know, all the kids, we're not big enough to be, you know, have these organizations town by town. So we combine and a lot of the stuff is centralized in Waitsfield. Um, so anyway, we bought some land a couple of years ago from um, Kingsbury's, which is uh, right across the street from where I now live. Um, so I'm right across the street from Mad River Park. And it is, uh, it is a um, phenomenal playing field for both soccer and lacrosse and, you know, people that come from other towns just can't believe we have a resource like this. Um, so those are some big things. It's interesting that you asked, you know, to some highlights because um, we're about to go into 30 years of existence and we're trying to do um, a summary of what we've done. And um, I have been on the board the longest. I think I, I went on in the late nineties at some point. 
Um, and I've been the very treasurer cool. ever since. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with me um, sure. for my viewers. So let's move on to you being a senior baseball player. <laughs> Talk to us about your team and what position do you play? And um, share that with us. And how long you've been? have you been playing um, on this team? Yep. Well, so I, my baseball career started when I was, I don't know, seven, eight. <laughs> and um, I did play a little bit in college. And uh, the Vermont Senior Baseball League is for 35 and older. Uh, wow. So it's not really senior 65 mm -hmm. and older. Um, but each team is allowed to have four players between the ages of 35 and 40. You know, it, the, the idea being to seed the team for years to come. Right. Um, me, myself, and uh, a teammate, Mike Riccardi, have, um, I started the team in 2002, and he and I played together on a team in Colchester in 2001, and I was like, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to be doing my home games all the way in Colchester, and so uh, he and I uh, said, you know, we think we can start a team in the Mad River Valley, so 2002, uh, started the team and it's been going strong ever since. And he and I are the the longest tenured players in the in the league at this point. How, how do you all do? Um, we so that uh, when people ask how the Mad River Valley team, we don't have a nickname. We're just called Mad River Valley. Um, ask, you know, what kind of team are we? We are we're in the middle. We uh, we are competitive in most games and. Um, we don't get blown out by the great teams. We don't um, outscore the lower teams by, uh, you know, dozens of runs. We're, we're, we're competitive and we have fun, you know, because so no, none of us are going to the pros. You're middle of the road. So what position do you play? Um, I pitch and oh. um, that's the position I played in college. Wow. Pitcher. So I pitch, which, you know, as you get older, it's pretty strenuous on your body. I would say. Um, and, uh, and when I'm not pitching, I play pretty much anywhere. I can play any position. And so I'll, I'll fill holes. You so know, what's your favorite I'm team? A uh, professional team. Yeah. I'm a Boston Red Sox I figured, fan. I figured that. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm going to move on. <laughs> sure. There's so much about you. Yeah, so much about you. You're a Renaissance man. I do. I do play ice hockey as well. Oh, you uh, do? oh my gosh. I now, do. Did you do that up at Letty? No, uh, we have a great rink in Waterbury. Oh my gosh! And uh, it's a late, it's a late night. I play in a league that uh, we don't get on the ice until nine thirty. Oh wow! Which is um, a little tough on school nights. I um, would say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're getting home at midnight and maybe not getting to sleep till one. But well, that's, um, a, that's I, you know, hockey is a great game. It is. It's really fluid. Um, but as you age, and you know, I'm one of the older players in that group. Uh, and so playing against 20 to 25 year olds has become That's more tough. and more challenging. It's a lot of exercise. So we're gonna move into the War and Fourth of July parade. Oh boy. Four pages <laughs> on you and we're, we're more than halfway through our interview. You are, it's an icon of town parades. It focuses often on the political realities of our time. Bernie Sanders never misses the parade. Um, and thousands come out to scream and holler and dance and laugh. Now the floats are amazing. And the themes do bring home the fact that Vermont is inherently a progressive state. You are an MC of that of that parade, correct? Mm -hmm. I got the best seat in the house. That is so Every cool. single float stops and struts their stuff in front of me. And you and Karen <laughs> Anderson, right? Uh, Karen Anderson organizes all of the vol uh, the volunteers for the judging. Uh -huh. um, and she is the one that asked me to MC. And um, I did it one year and then uh, I didn't do the next year. And then she asked me to do it, do it again. And I said, well, if I'm going to do it again, uh, I need I need my wife, Allison Duckworth, to join me. Allison, great and lady. so uh, she is the uh, she's the color commentary, the the comments, uh, you know, she's just sort of uh, says whatever comes to her mind. And I'm the one that keeps everything organized and. Uh, identifies what's happening good for uh, her good so yeah. it's a husband and wife team husband and wife team right fantastic so now let's move into what i think is probably your greatest love other than allison the valley <laughs> players the valley players now the website to my viewers is valleyplayers.com it's that simple mm -hmm. please visit the website it's wonderful i loved every bit of it now this community theater has been in existence for 45 years 
It was started in 1968 by Tony Egan, Bob Law, and Gary Murdoch. So talk to us a little bit about the theater and its early years. Right. So uh, I just want to point out that if people are doing the math, they're going to be like, wait a minute, that's way more than 45 years. Oh. Um, <laughs> but that's OK, because so they those folks did start something called the Valley Players Theater, and then it sort of went by the wayside. And then in 19, um, 1979, Mitchell Kontoff and Jennifer Howard kind of got the ball rolling again. Um, and so we've been going continuously since 1979. Okay. Which is, Thank you for that uh, clarification. Yeah, you bet. You bet. And I forgot the question. What was the question? Well, it just was, you know, talk a little bit about those early years. And then I'm going to go oh. into 1988 when the Valley Players purchased the Odd Fellows Hall. Yeah. Into their performance space, which is where you remain today. So, right, right. Talk so, a bit about those early years and how you got involved. Yeah. So, the early years was, you know, before my time. Um, I was still in high school in 19. 19- 79. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, that group of people were just like, you know, we want to do something for the, we want to do something. We love theater. We just want to make something happen. And the first show happened at, uh, faced elementary school, by the way, uh, also before my time. So they, uh, put on the show there, Harvey. And it's funny because, um, I I've always looked at that play and I'm like, you know, I would love to play the main character Elwood. And which you did, uh, didn't you? Which I did when we did our 40th anniversary. And, that. you know, so we have this thing where we have never repeated a show. Wow. And that was that was Jennifer Howard was pretty adamant about that. that. You know, she's like, there's so many shows out there. Why would you ever repeat something? And so for our 40th anniversary, we decided we were going to repeat our shows. And so the first one we did was Harvey. And I was so excited. And uh, I got the part. And it was uh, it was a thrill. Yeah. Um, I joined the I joined the board in uh, my first show that I did was 1997. I did um, I played a minstrel in um, Once Upon a Mattress, and um, I got I got that part because I was singing in the Madre uh, Corral with uh, Mitchell Kontoff, and he said, you know, wh why don't you uh, think about you know coming out. Um, and so I did, and I've been involved. I got on the board the very within the year. I, was, I got on the board. So um, you, so you, you folks produce three to four shows per year, mm -hmm. and your hosts hosts of also the Vermont Play Playwright Circle. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a lot of shows. It is. It is a lot of shows. In addition to that, we do something called Cabin Fever Follies, which I MC with Susan Loind. And then a couple of years ago in COVID, we launched um, the Mad River Story Slam, which I also host with Susan Loind. And um, so those are their productions. They're not full shows. Uh, Cabin Fever Follies is a variety show. It gets pe the community members out. We've had a lot of people like I don't know. I don't know if you know this uh, woman named Shana Taub. Have you heard oh, that? We're going to talk about that. Okay. I actually have that on my, one of my questions. But, uh, yeah. You know, we have a lot of people who have come through the Valley Player stage that are out there performing around the world, which is York, pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, um, pretty and amazing. so, yes, doing three to four shows is it's a lot. We almost all we almost we do always do a musical in June and July. And this year we're doing spam a lot. I know I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, spam a lot June 27th through July 14th. Yeah, this is based on the Monty Python Holy Grail yeah. the musical, so that's happening it, in the summer. Yeah, I'm working on the set with that with my friend Jay Seekins, and um, it's uh, are I you mean, in it? Are you I'm not in it, I'm doing the set because uh, I usually take a vacation at the end of June right after okay. school gets out. Okay, um, and so and then in the fall, we often do a show that is um pretty well known um and we gear it towards leaf peepers you know thinking that people you know people are in town we want them to have something to do and uh so this coming fall we're doing um agatha christie's uh mousetrap i saw that with my father on off broadway when i was nine cool. years old cool Great. well you'll have to I come down there. to see our show i will i will <laughs> and now um so i want to encourage all of my viewers to visit valleyplayers.com and check out their summer and fall performances and learn how to get involved. And if you support theater, which you should, yeah. there is a donate button on the website and I encourage you to donate. 
Um, you can also find the Valley Players on their very colorful, fun, and informative Facebook page. Now, there's a survey that I noticed posted on your Facebook page. How is the Mad River Valley doing? It is a MRV well-being survey. How do you think the state of Vermont is doing to ensure that the arts are serving our community and our families? And what can we do better, Doug? You know, I mean, the thing that need that the arts need always is money because putting on productions is costly and just selling tickets does not come anywhere close, no matter what level of theater. Um, for years, I was in shows with Peter Boynton um, up at the up at the Round Barn. And, you know, they, you know, he had professionals come in from New York to do stuff. And he was like, and, you know, he was like, you can't do, you can't do shows just on, on tickets. You need, you need uh, community support. You need um, support from your local businesses. And, you know, if you've got, uh, if your if your government, whatever that might be, uh, has money, you know, you need support from that too. Um, it's hard. You know, the arts are always thought of as something that, Oh, it's extra. It's just fun, you know, uh, but if you look at history, what do we uh, remember about civilizations? We remember their art. You know, art, is what remember art, is what art is what defines civilizations. Yeah. And by the way, the amount of money that the arts brings into Vermont is in the tens of hundreds of millions. People of want them. something to do and they're, they you know, it's, and it's artistic things that they're looking to Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I would assume that the that the well-being survey for Mad River is probably coming back with a lot of positive vibes because it's a great right. So that that's actually not our survey, but we're helping, oh. you know, spread we're the word. Get spread the word. But I just wanted to mention that you're doing that. Thank I think you. all towns should do this. So yeah. now we'll talk about Shana Taub. I mean, she's arrived on Broadway. Yeah. Major yes. national news media outlets often see it next to Hillary Clinton from yeah. Suffs now on Broadway. Yeah. She wrote the story, wrote the music and the songs and stars in the show. So she got her start probably in the Valley Players. She did. But and she was always a powerhouse. Um, you know, it was she it, it was a, it was as if she always knew that this, she was going to end up where she is. Where she um, is. You know, she's yes. really strong singer, really uh, great musician and very strong personality. Her right. mom was very much uh, behind her and encouraged her. Um, yeah, she was Annie when she was eight, something like that. Um, she uh, participated in a lot of our Cabin Fever Follies. She was in several shows. I did several shows with her over at the Skinner Barn with Peter Boynton. Um, uh, yeah, and then she, you know, she did all the shows at Harwood, you know, Har Harwood High School. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, awesome. she got her start at our little theater. Bravo. <laughs> well, you have a lot of great notables. Yeah. Uh, Grace Potter way. was another yeah. one, you know, she, right. and she actually lives back in town. She moved back. I know she does. I know yeah. I was at Sparky's party. Okay. So Doug, how yes. are you comprehending the issues of our children that our children are facing today? Of course, the most pressing issue, as far as I'm concerned, is climate change, but we also have the fate of our democracy. Uh, how are you comprehending that issue and, and uh, sharing and teaching to your, to your uh, students? That's interesting. Before I got on this call, I spoke with a friend, Sal Spinoza, who um, he has uh, an article, a weekly article in our paper set called The Climate Corner. I read it. And, and you've read it. And he said, Doug, I want to get kids involved. It's their future. They should be writing about it. I said, OK. So, uh, you know, we're near the end of the, the year this year. And uh, so I said, OK, you know, September 10th, you're coming into my classroom. You're going to pitch your idea and we're going to get an article a week out of my class. So uh, that's something we're putting in putting into action right now. Um, well, I read some of the essays on on the Internet that from. Your yep. students. Yeah. That climate. Yeah. yeah. So I think that. Um, and democracy, I mean. I mean there, kid, kids have a lot of things going on right now. They do, uh, I know. You know. People say that, that that oh, thank God COVID's over, but... The residual. The, 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 there's a lot of residual from COVID. I mean, there's... The kids that were in kindergarten and first grade missed a lot of... You know, I talked about the responsive classroom. They missed all of that. How to just interact with other people and share, you know, some basic stuff they lost 
you know, and forget about the kids that were in, I mean, high school that lost those crucial years. So, so Doug, looking out 10 to 20 years, what do you envision for our children and our children's children? What are your hopes and your fears? Well, world peace. Isn't that what you're supposed to say, right? No, uh, okay. Yeah, you can say that. I'd accept yeah. that. <laughs> um, well, you know, I hope we have an understanding world. I do think I do think kids are when you talk about gender identity and stuff like that, I think kids are way more understanding and open to that than adults are. You know, I mean, and it's racial been, issues, racial issues too. It, it's just been part it's of been their right. Yeah. I mean, it's been part of everything around them. You know, and the matter of valley is not particularly racially diverse, which is, I would say, a downside about our community, but um, and Vermont, 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 yeah. Vermont in general. Um, uh, but, you know, I hope I, I hope that the future people are uh, uh, embracing of one another, understanding of one another, um, you know, are aware, you know, they're going to be they're suffering from the uh, actions of the last 40 years in industrialization. So, um, you know, they're going to have to deal with those consequences and, and figure stuff out because, um, uh, it, the, the, well, uh, th things are, things could go downhill quickly. Yes, that's really true. Well, look, let me tell you, we're out of time. I mean, I could have talked to you all afternoon, but Take You're one amazing human being. I'm um, de deeply honored to have shared your life and your wisdom with my viewers. And Doug, I want to thank you for being on my show. And you will see me over in the Valley. Uh, your performances, I want to get more involved. So thank cool. you for all your work that you do. You for, bet. And for your town. Thanks for being with me. And to my viewers, I want to thank you all for being here today. And I will see you shortly. Have a great evening. Good night.